Hey, before we get started, I want to show you something that uh, my wife got me for Christmas. Now, her, her father always got the young men in the family toys for Christmas. So this Christmas, Karen got all the young men and the old man in the family a toy. And this is just the coolest thing. And um, it can be a disaster because it did get away from me in the first service. So we're going to see how, how this goes. But... Isn't that cool? Now, if I take my hand, it just drops. But if I have my hand under it, it flies. And this is supposed to be, that's supposed to turn it off. Hey, how about that? That worked. All right, yeah. So, uh, so um, each one of these have like a character on them. And so she got like Batman and Superman and Spider-Man for the, other, for the young guys. She got me Angry Birds. Uh huh. You think there's a message in that? I think so. Uh, all right. So, hey, if this is your first time with us, we want you to know we always start messages on Sunday morning with toys. But uh, no, we are we are so glad that you uh, are with us. And one of the things that we want you to know about our church is that uh, on most Sunday mornings you'll find us uh, studying our way through, teaching our way through whole books of the Bible. And right now we are studying our way through the New Testament book of Romans, and Romans is an absolutely essential book for a Christian to read and study and understand. It's not the easiest book to understand, but it's packed with very important information because that, that information that results in transformation. But the, but the book of Romans tells us who God is, who we are, and why the world is is messed up the way it is. The book of Romans tells us how to become a Christian, what happens to us when we become Christians, and it also tells us how to live as Christians. And really, what, 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 what the book of Romans shows us is, and what Paul is trying to show people is he's trying to show a very religious group of people that, the way I would say it, is that Christianity technically is not a religion. That Christianity is technically not a, Christianity doesn't operate the way religion operates. Now, religion is basically our attempt to connect with God by doing good things and avoiding bad things, and generally that involves obeying a bunch of rules. Now, the problem with religion is that we're not very good rule keepers. I mean, if, if you're honest, no matter what religion you might try to follow, or, or maybe it's your own moral guidance or whatever, you know that, uh, if you're honest, that uh, you might follow some of the rules some of the time, but you don't follow all the rules all of the time, and that's why we have come up with the scale system, so that, that, that there's a scale in heaven that if you're at the end, in the end, if your good, good outweighs your bad, then you're okay with God, but uh, that kind of leaves you teetering on you know, kind of like, well, wondering, well, what if God were to show up or I were to die tomorrow, you know, or something happened, and what if, what if, what if I stand before God and he goes, you know, you almost had it. I mean, it was so close, but the scales just wouldn't tip in your favor, and many religious people live with the uneasy feeling that I just don't measure up. I wonder what God thinks of me. I wonder if God's mad at me, or is God happy with me? And there are a lot of believers, people who have trusted Christ for salvation. Many believers live the same way because they're under the assumption that God is up there in heaven and he's grading us on our performance. And the truth is we're not very good performers when it comes to keeping a bunch of, of rules. And so many Christians feel condemned and, and we feel like we just... We just need to do more and to try harder. And on days when we're pretty good, we think, oh, God gave us a gold star on our paper that day. But on days we kind of blow it, then we're like, ah, no gold star. God's probably mad at me. And, and so we're caught in the middle of wanting to do right. We're caught in this struggle of wanting to do right, but never, ever being able to quite consistently pull it off. And as a result, we live more under the shadow of condemnation than in the light of God's love. And that brings us to Romans 7. So take your Bible, paper or digital. You really got to have your face in the Bible. Uh, it will really help because we're going to go through all of Romans 7. And this is a hard passage to understand, but I'm going to do my very best to explain it clearly. 
and then apply it in the end. But Romans 7 is about the struggle we have with sin. It's about our ongoing struggle with sin. It's about wanting to do right but never quite being able to pull it off. Now, I'm going to be honest with you right up front. There's a lot of disagreement among scholars and theologians and commentators on the meaning of Romans 7. And there are uh, really good, godly, solid, sound, biblical people who believe that what Paul is talking about in Romans 7 is his life before he met Christ. That this is pre-conversion Paul because they feel that some of the things that Paul says in this passage just don't fit with our being this new person that God has made us to be in Christ. Others, like myself, believe this does describe our ongoing struggle with sin, and um, we, we and, and the way I take it, and I'm, I'm not going to lay out two views, you didn't come to church to get a theology class in, uh, this morning, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out why I believe that the text teaches that uh, Romans 7 is about our ongoing struggle with sin, and uh, you know, so I'm just going to give you the right view, okay? All right, so anyway, now put simply... Romans 7 says this, sin is the problem and Jesus is the answer, all right? Sin is the problem and Jesus is the answer. And I know that sounds cliche, I know it sounds christian easy, but knowing how Jesus saves us from our struggle with sin and how he saves us from the condemnation that we feel when we blow it and when we fall into sin is the single most important thing that you can know about the Christian life. So this is very, very important. Now let me do a little review. Um, uh, The book of Romans, in the book of Romans, Paul is writing to a community of Christ followers living in the city of... All right, let's try that one more time. All right, this is the book of Romans, and so Paul is writing to believers living in the city of... Rome. And the church in Rome was made up of people from two different backgrounds. You had people who were raised in a Jewish background and people who were raised in Greek backgrounds. And in, cha- in chapter 7, Paul is focused on those who came from a Jewish background. Look at chapter 7, verse 1. He says, Or do you not know my brothers? For I am speaking to those who know the law. So who would that be? That would be believers who were raised in Jewish homes. They were raised to know the law from birth. They were raised in all the rules and rituals and commands and statutes and precepts of the Jewish religion. But also in this church, there are Gentiles who did not grow up knowing the law. In fact, they still don't know much of the Old Testament. And there's a division in the church between these two groups. They they, they really don't like each other very much, and that's one of the reasons Paul is writing this uh, letter to them to try to unite them. But the problem is these Jewish believers look at these Gentile believers and, and they say, we're supposed to have fellowship with these people, these pork-loving, emperor-worshipping, pagan people? Ah, no, if these Gentiles are going to be a part of God's family, they got to know the law and obey the law. What they need is to, they need more rules. They need more rules. And in Romans 7, Paul is saying, no, that's not the way it works. That's religion. That's not Christianity. He's saying if you think these Gentiles need more rules, then you really don't understand the depth of the problem of sin that we all struggle with because he says fixing the problem with sin goes much deeper than trying harder to obey more rules. He's saying obeying the law will not help you in your struggle with sin, and he's going to unpack exactly what he means by that in this chapter. Now, to backtrack... Back in chapter 6, Paul has said, when you become a Christian, you become a brand new person with a brand new life. God has made you to be in your innermost self, your spiritual self that will live forever. God has made you a brand new person. And one of the ramifications of that is something very mysterious and deep and hard to get our minds around, but he says at the moment that you trusted Christ, when you became a Christian, as far as God is concerned, when Christ died 2,000 years ago, you died with him. Now, when Christ died, you died. The Bible teaches, again, when Jesus died on the cross, you 
were there, you died with him, and everyone who would believe in him from that day forward was, were, uh, was also on the cross. Now, that is strange, but it's true. Like, I don't understand how computer chips work, but I use computers every day. And I don't understand how, when I died with Christ uh, 2,000 years ago, I don't understand that, but I can appropriate it every single day. Now, how we've been talking about appropriating it is telling ourselves what? Sin has no power over me. Because I died with Christ and Christ died to sin, I also died to sin, so we've been saying sin has no power over me. Why not? Because not only did Jesus die for the, to save us from the penalty of our sin, he died to save us from the power of our sin. Now, Paul takes that idea one step further in chapter 7. He says, you have died with Christ to sin, but you have also died to the law. You've died to the law. And in the first six verses, he's going to tell us why that's true, that we've died with the law. Look at it. He's, he, verse seven, chapter 7, verse 1, he says, The law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. And, and so, what he, and so in Christ, here's the point, in Christ we have died to sin and we have also died to the law. So the question in the minds of those Jewish believers in the church would have been something like this. Okay, Paul, if we have died to the law like you say, then, then doesn't the law, doesn't it help keep us right with God? I mean, what's the purpose of the law? That's the question that Paul is addressing in Romans 7. Doesn't the law help us stay right with God? Doesn't it keep us right with God? Isn't obedience to the law essential for us to become the people that God wants us to be. And startling as it may be, Paul says, no, no, at least not in the way they think of it. Fact is, verse 4, he says, you were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. In other words, you died to the law by being united with Christ in his death so you could be joined to Christ. And the illustration that Paul uses, he, he points to the relationship between a wife and her husband to illustrate the new relationship that believers have to the law. And basically, he says in verse 2, you know that a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she's no longer bound. She is uh, free to remarry. Now, that, I mean, we, that, we all know that. That's something we know. So he said, and you know that, and he's saying... That is the way it is now in your relationship with the law. You have been united with Christ in his death, and that means that you have died to the law. And because you have died to the law, that means you have been released from the law, meaning your relationship to the law has changed now that you are joined to Christ. Look at verse 5. For while we were living in the flesh, that is, before you became a Christian... Before God made you new, he says, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in these mortal bodies of ours so that we bore fruit for death. Verse 6, but now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive. What, What held us captive? The law. For what purpose? So we now serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Now look at that. Verse 6 is the Christian life. If you don't understand verse 6, you don't understand the Christian life. Here it is again in the NIV. But now, by dying to that which once bound us, the law, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Religion is about trying hard to live by laws and list of rules. Christianity is about living in a new kind of relationship with God by the power of the Holy Spirit. So verse 6, star it, circle it, underline it, put an exclamation point in the margin because verse 6 is, it explains the difference between religion and the Christian life and it is a summary of everything that Paul is going to say going forward. 
Now, Paul is going to unpack what this new way of the Spirit is in Romans chapter 8, but for now, and we're going to slow down, by the way, when we get to chapter 8. We, I think we have five messages slotted for Romans 8, but we're talking about doing 8 and 8. All right, we're still looking at that, but we're going to slow way down because Romans 8 is the normal Christian life. But right here, right now, Paul has to convince these Jewish believers that the law can in no way make us right or keep us right with God, and he's going to show them that the law has no power to help us in our struggle with sin. Okay, now, when these Jewish believers heard this, you've died to the law, you've been released from the law, you're no longer bound to the law, they get defensive, and so they're like, what do you mean we're, de- with the, we're, we, we're no longer bound to the law? Are you saying that the law is sinful, Paul? Are you saying that the law is a bad thing, to which he says in verse 7, absolutely not. And then in, se- in verses 7 to 13, he goes on to tell them that the law is not the problem. The law is holy, righteous, and good. So he gives three reasons why the law is good. Look at the, uh, Read verse 7 with me. I would not have known what sin is had it not been for the law, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness, for apart from the law sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death for me, for sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Now that's that's a dense passage. That's this is hard, some, hard to understand, and so I, I want to focus on three things that Paul says about the law that we need to understand, three reasons the law is good. The first one is the law is a good thing because it tells us what sin is. The law defines sin for us. He says it pretty, very clearly there. He says, how, how would I have even known what sin is? How would I have known what coveting is? And coveting is basically not being content with the things that God has given you and always wanting more and and wanting different, and that leads to all kinds of other sins. But Paul says, unless there had been a law, a rule, a commandment that said, do not covet, I wouldn't have known what coveting is. Okay, that's pretty straightforward, is it not? All right, second, he says, the law exposes sin in us. The law is a good thing because it exposes sin in us. It defines sin for us. It exposes sin in us. Look at verse 8. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness, for apart from the law, sin is dead. What does that mean? Apart from the law, sin is dead. Basically this. Simply this. The law exposes sin in me. Now, here's the way, here's the way that works. Um, when I was in school at Florida State, I, was, uh, I lived in a dorm, and I was an, uh, an RA in the dorm, and one of the duties that RAs had was uh, late at night when you were on duty, you had to walk all of the halls uh, of, the, of, of the dorm, check all the doors, and you had to go down in the basement. And the basement was dark and dan- dank, and, and uh, it, was, it, was, it was a scary place. And this was in 1977, 78, when Ted Bundy, Bundy was, was running loose all over the Florida State campus. I mean, this was serious stuff. So, I mean, we, we were, like, I'm in the basement, you know, at 2 o'clock in the morning, making sure all the doors are, are shut. And so one, one, one night, I'm down there, and I would carry a flashlight with me. And so one night I was down there and I'm going through, you know, and, you know, you're, and, and, and then I hear this, shh, 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 and I'm like, what? you know, I, and, and shh, shh, I heard it again. And so I'm like, ooh, what is that? And I saw this like stack of boxes and, you know, so I went over there and I, I pulled the boxes back and, and you know what I saw? I saw? There were like a million cockroaches. And when I shined the flashlight on them, they went, just like that. I mean, they, that'll probably show up in Charlie Boyd out of context. But anyway, uh, so they, they froze, and then they ran for cover. Now, what, what happened? It was like the, the, the flashlight exposed the problem of the, the cockroaches. That's the, that's the law. The, the, the law is not the problem. 
It simply exposes the problem. The law exposes the problem of sin in us, which is absolutely a good thing. Now, if you're here today and you're not a, a believer, you're not a Christian, then um, and, and you know, you're not sure about all this, here's, here's why the law is a good thing. Because in order to become a Christian, we all had to come to a point where we knew that there were things that God said to do and not to do, but we had to come to a point where we realized, wow, If God says I need to do all of this all of the time, I'm never going to make it. You have to come to a point where you go, this is God's law, and it points out how far I fall short. And the the good thing about that is it, it points us to our need of a Savior because Jesus can do for us what we can't do for ourselves. And so by exposing our sin, we see our need for a Savior. And that, and, and because of, uh, and, and that is kind of like proof that the law is a good thing. But that's not all. He says one more thing here that, about the law being a good thing, which is really strange at first. And we wonder, like, how could this be a good thing? But he says, not only does the law define sin for us and expose sin in us, but it also, he also says the law stimulates sin in us. It provokes sin in us. You see that back in verse 5. When he says, our sinful passions at work in the parts of our mortal body are aroused by the law. And you see it again here in verse 8. But sin, look at this, but sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of coveting. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, Sin came alive, verse 11, for sin, here it is again, seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. Now let me just give you my paraphrase of how I think if Paul were here and we said, would you explain that whole thing about what do you mean sin came alive? What does it mean that I was alive apart from the law? Here's how I think that he would say it. I think he would say, well, there was a time when you could say I was alive apart from the law, meaning at one time I lived without understanding the true purpose of the law. Now, of course, I knew the law because I grew up in a Jewish home, and so I was raised to know the law from my earliest days. And I worked hard to obey the rules and the regulations, and I felt like I was good with God. I mean, I've said this before, but, you know, I was circumcised on the eighth day according to the laws of Israel. I was from the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I mean, as to the law, I was perfect and blameless. As to the law, I was blameless. Now, what I mean by that is I knew the law behaviorally. Because I knew the first nine commandments. I, I didn't worship idols. I honored my parents, and I didn't lie or, or cheat or steal or commit adultery. But I'll tell you, when that commandment about coveting came alive to me, when it exposed the extreme sinfulness of sin in me, in a very real sense, it killed me. I mean, I could see for the first time in my life, I was dead in the water before God. I kept the rules behaviorally, but I didn't understand the convicting power of the law until that command about coveting came home to my heart, and that aha experience was like, I will never measure up. He began to, I began to see, when I heard, do not covet, it exposed sin in my heart, but you know what else it did? It produced all kinds of coveting in me, and I realized I realized that, the, that more rules only stimulates more rule breaking. Now, take a look at these signs here. Do not walk on the grass. Next sign. Wet, wet paint, do not touch. Now, when you see a wet paint, do not touch sign, what do you want to do? You want to touch it, right? I mean, you came in here this morning, you walked all through this building, you got walls all around. Nobody went over and thought, I mean, I need to touch the walls. But if there was signs on the walls or a sign on a table or something that said, do not touch, you would be like, hmm. I mean, that's the way we, I mean, we're wired that way. I mean, I, lo- I love family guy here. I mean, he, he's like, do not push the button and look at his eyes. I mean, I mean, what is Peter Griffin going to do here? I mean, he's going to touch that button. He's going to push the button because he just has to see. See, the law exposes sin in me, but it also stimulates sin in me. Now, the question is, what is up with that? Why is that? Well, Augustine was a guy who lived in the 5th century, and he had a huge shaping influence on the church. And St. Saint, Saint Augustine, if you were 
raised in Florida or you're a layperson or Augustine if you took the class. But Augustine was a genius and he wrote a 13-volume book called Confessions, which is about what? Confessions. All right, yeah. It's just like Rome, Rome. Yeah, okay, anyway. So, confessing. And so, it's a classic work. It's a classic work, a major piece of literature. Now, in Confessions... Augustine confesses to a sin that he committed in his early days. He said he and a bunch of friends went out late one night, and there was a pear orchard close to his home, and so they decided that they would go steal a bunch of pears. So they went to the orchard, and they got under a tree, and they shook the tree, and guess what fell out? A million cockroaches. Just kidding. All right. Gotcha. Okay, all these, tree, all these pears fell out of the tree. And so they picked up as many as they could carry, and they ran away with them. And he said, you know, the thing is, we didn't need the pears. I had pears at home. And we took a couple of bites out of the pears, but we never even ate a whole pear. What we did is we stole them, and then we fed them to pigs. So why did they do that? He says, our real pleasure was simply in doing something that was not allowed. He said, once I had taken them, I threw them away, and all I tasted in them was my own iniquity, which I enjoyed very much. (laughs) Father of the church. All right, so he goes on to explain why, when we see a sign that says, wet paint, do not touch, why we want to touch it. He says, I enjoyed what was forbidden for no other reason except that it was forbidden. Now, why is that? Well, he explains that. He says, because deep inside of us, all of us, there's there's something in us that wants to be God. He says there's something in us that wants to imitate omnipotence. Where do we get that? We got it from Adam. That goes back to Romans chapter 5. Because of Adam's sin, we all have a deep desire to want to be in charge, to be in control. We want to be our own gods. What was the original temptation. You will be like God. God said, don't eat of the tree, eat of the tree. You'll be like God. And so every rule that God gives us is an an infringement on our own autonomy. It's an infringement on our own desire to be God. And that is the essence of sin, our wanting to be our own God. So there's this, there's something in all of us that when we see that sign, wet paint, do not touch, we are like, what do you mean don't touch? Who tells, who, who's saying that I can't touch it? I'll touch it if I want to. I mean, that's, that's in us. Now, yes, God has made us new in our innermost being, in our innermost selves, but we live in these mortal bodies. And down in chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, Paul says we, this pull of sin that we still feel is a law, at the law of sin and death. And by law, he means a fixed reality, a fixed, unchangeable reality. There is a fixed reality of sin that lives in our mortal bodies, and that is our number one problem as a Christian. The law of sin and death resides in our physical bodies, and that's true of all people, all time, all cultures, all languages. It's a part of the power of sin that has come to us through Adam. And Paul tells us here that law, Rules and commandments not only exposes sin in us, it actually provokes us to sin. And so so that too is a good thing because knowing that's the way the law works in us ought to tell us that there is that no amount of trying harder, no amount of trying to obey more rules will set us free from this struggle. All right, verse 13, question. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. Now, he's going to summarize now everything he said so far. He says, it was sin, not the law. It was sin producing death in me that through that which is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and, the, and, and through the commandment provoking sin in me, sin might be shown to be sinful beyond measure. He's saying the law is not the problem. The law is me. It's kind of like, let's say in your neighborhood, there's a burglar and he's breaking into homes. That's against the law, right? So he's breaking into homes, but finally the guy gets caught. He gets caught and he's arrested and he's put in jail. He comes before the judge and the judge pronounces him guilty and he sentences him to five years in prison. 
Now, to that guy, the law is a bad thing. To us, is the law a bad thing? No, the law is a good thing. The problem is not with the law that says this is what uh, um, uh, breaking the law looks like. This is what sin is. The problem is not with the law. The problem is with sin in me. And that's, what, that's the point that he's making um, right, right there. All right, so are you, are you with me? I got one section, one more section. Go take a deep breath. All right, all right. So Paul has established that the law is a good thing. It defines sin for us. It exposes sin in us and even stimulates, provokes sin in us, which is a good thing because it shows us that we are powerless to, to overcome our struggle with sin through more rules. Now, now he's going to unpack why people who have been made new still struggle with ongoing sin, and he's going to use his own personal experience to make that point. Verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual. The law is good. He says, but I am of flesh sold under sin. Now, how can, that, how can a Christian say that? And that's one of the reasons why people do not believe that this is about, uh, this can be the experience of a Christian. But he's going to tell us exactly what he means by that. And what he's saying is, the I of the I am sold under sin is the I of his flesh. Stay with me. He's saying, I still live in this mortal body which is and will always be under the pull of sin, okay? Now, remember last week, I put, put this chart up on the screen, this diagram on the screen, how Paul sees himself as a two-part person. He is in his innermost self, in his spiritual self that will live forever. He is a redeemed new man, but he, he lives in an old body. He lives in unredeemed mortality, and he basically says the struggle that we have is between the new you that God has made you to be and this pull of sin in the flesh. And like I said last week, distinguishing between these two things is extremely helpful in being able to deal with sin in our lives. Now, he describes his own struggle with sin. Look at it. For I do not understand my own actions. Actually, he, he does, but he's doing this for effect. I do not do what I want to do, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I don't want to do, I agree with the law that it's good. If I do what I don't want to do, I agree with the law that it's good. What does that mean? It means if I do wrong, the law exposes that it's wrong, and that's a good thing. All right, see that? If I do wrong, the law exposes that wrong, and that's a good thing. But, verse 17, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me that does it. All right, see that? Now, Paul, again, he sees himself as a two-part person. That's why he can say, I, I want to do right, and when I do wrong, it's really, it's not, it's not the me that God created me to be. It's still that pull of sin in my flesh. Now, what that does not allow you to do, men, is the next time that your wife gets on you about something that you should have done but you didn't do and you knew you ought to have done it, when she gets on you, you can't say, well, it isn't I, it's sin in me that didn't do it. All right, you can't use this as an excuse, and neither can you ladies. But anyway, look at again how he emphasizes in verse 18 these two parts. He says, for I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, I keep on doing. But if I do what I, do, if I, do what I don't want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. You see, it's the same point again. So, Paul, how do you explain this struggle with sin? Here it is. So, I find it to be a law, circle that, that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For in my inner being, I delight in the law of God. In other words, I delight in how God says I should live my life. That's that part of me, the new self. I delight in that, but I see in the parts of my body, another, another what? Another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my body. How does he describe his body? Verse 24, this body of death. Now stop right there. Paul sees himself as a two-part person living under two conflicting laws. 
In Romans 8, 2, he clearly articulates the two laws when he, said, he talks about the law of sin and death and the law of the spirit of life. The law of the spirit of life and the law of sin and death. Every believer lives with these two conflicting laws. These two fixed realities. The law of sin and death in the flesh and the law of the spirit of life which operates in the new person that God has created us to be. The law of sin and death is like gravity that pulls us down. The law of the spirit of life is like the law of aerodynamics that is able to lift us up. So this helicopter, you thought I was just telling you about Christmas toys. It's a sermon illustration. So what this is, this, this illustrates that there are two laws at work here. There is the law of gravity and there's the law of aerodynamics. And these two laws are in constant conflict with each other. So yes, God has made me new. I have the Spirit of God living inside me. I want to do right. That, and it is the Spirit of God that, that lifts me up. But at the same time, I live in this old body that's waiting to be redeemed and made new when I stand before God. I'm not taking this body to heaven with me. But I live in this body, and so I live as a two-part person with two conflicting laws, and that is why we struggle with ongoing sin. Now, I take it that Galatians 5.17 is a one-sentence summary of Romans 7 and 8. Galatians 5.17 says, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. Now, he's talking about the spirit that lives in the new man. So, the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. Look, they are in conflict with each other so that you are not able to do whatever you want. And Paul's point goes back to the big question that he's addressing with these Jewish believers in the church in Rome. He's addressing the same question with the church in Galatia, and, and, and he's talking about how the law doesn't help us. And in the very next verse in Galatians 5.18, he says, if you are led by the Spirit, you are what? not under the law. So do you see how Paul it, Paul is making it clear to us that the law does not offer any kind of solution in trying to overcome our struggle with sin. He's making that point in Romans and in Galatians. The law cannot make us right with God and it cannot keep us right with God. And he's saying if you think that more rules will make you more godly, then you don't understand the problem of sin. You don't understand the depth of the problem of sin or the purpose of the law. Here's what he's saying. He's saying if you try to deal with your struggle with sin by trying harder to obey more rules... You will, not weaken, you will not weaken the pull of sin in your flesh. You will only strengthen it, and in the process, you'll make yourself miserable. He's saying if you try to deal with your struggle with sin by trying harder to obey more rules, you will not weaken the pull of sin. You'll actually strengthen it and in the process make yourself more miserable. And his point is, is that just as Christ has saved us from the power of sin, or the penalty of sin, it is also our salvation comes through Jesus in saving us from the power of, of sin. In other words, the same gospel that saves us changes us, not the law. The same gospel that saves us changes us, not the law. God's purpose in giving us the law was not to save us from anything. The law defines sin for us, it exposes sin in us, and it actually produces sin in us, and that's a good thing, provokes sin in us. It's a good thing because we, have, we come to a point where we realize we are powerless to change. No amount of willpower, no amount of self-effort, self no amount of discipline will make us become the people that God wants us to be. In his book, The Imperfect Disciple, Jared Wilson describes his struggle with sin like this. He says, every day I wake up into Romans 7, every daggum day. 
My alarm goes off and I sit up in bed, my uncoffeed consciousness groggily geared up for sins, both of omission and commission. I'm engaged in the flesh before I, before I even get my feet on the carpet. Now, how many of you can identify with that? I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, every day we get up in Romans 7. Every day we drift into Romans 7. Romans 7 is the common experience of all believers, but listen, it may be the common experience that we have, but it is not the normal Christian life. The normal Christian life is in chapter 8. The normal Christian life is in chapter 8. Romans 7 is not the normal Christian life, but it does describe our ongoing struggle with sin. So, so here's the deal. Here's the deal. The normal Christian life is in 8. Now let me show you how these two connect. In Romans 7, Paul is going, oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to set me free from this? And then he turns around. The very first verse in chapter 8, he says, therefore there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. What's the connection? The connection is this. He's saying, you know what? God knows you struggle with sin. When you fail and when you fall, I want you to know this. I don't condemn you, so don't condemn yourself. Just turn back to Jesus and start all over again. That's the connection between Romans 7, Romans 8. No condemnation for the struggle you find yourself in. For the struggle you find yourself in. And so he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from what? From this body of death. Thanks be to God, deliverance comes not through the law, but through Jesus Christ our Lord, through Christ alone. And then he sums up before he goes to eight. He said, let me just, let me just make it clear one more time. Here's why we are going to struggle with sin until we wake up in the presence of Jesus. He says, so then I myself, my new self, I serve the law of God with my mind I want to do what God tells me to do, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. In other words, that, that in my flesh, I still, still feel the pull of sin, and he's saying the law cannot help me in this battle. Only Jesus can. The problem is sin in me. The answer is Jesus living in me. Thanks be to God, sin has no power over me. Jesus has set me free through the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at this. This is, thanks be to God, Jesus has set me free from the power of sin. That is the connection. Now, here, here it is. Listen, you and I cannot live the Christian life because the Christian life is Jesus' life, and there's only one person who could live Jesus' life, and that's Jesus so the starting point for living in this new way of the Spirit that he's going to unpack in chapter 8, the starting point begins with understanding that Jesus lives in you so he can live his life through you. Now, I know you're saying, I, I hear what you're saying, Charlie, but I, can't, I still can't quite get my mind around it. I know it's tough to understand. But, but here's the deal. The way that you live the Christian life is the same way that you enter the Christian life. So think about when you became a Christian. When you became a Christian, you stood before God and you said, you said, Lord, I, I, I know obeying more rules is not going to make me right with you. you know, right? So now that you become a Christian, you say, Lord, I know obeying mo more rules is not going to keep me right with you. When you became a Christian, you said, Lord, I know I can't save myself. And now that you are a Christian, you, you say to Jesus, Lord, I can't save myself from all of these things that plague me and pull me down. I can't do that. When you became a Christian, you said, Lord, would, would you do for me what I cannot do for myself? And every day of your life, 24-7, you're saying to Jesus, Jesus, would you do for me what I can't do for myself? Because just as helpless as you were when you faced a godless eternity without hope, so also every day of your life when you wake up, you're just as hopeless. Like, Lord, I am just as hopeless. Tomorrow I'm going to face, I have to be the man or the woman or the, the student or the employer, the boss that you want me to be. But God, I, I, I still am weak. I'm still powerless. I, 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 I can't overcome this power with anger. I can't overcome this power with lust on my own. I can't resist the pull of the 
peer pressure Jesus, would you live your life through me? See, that's, it's different from praying, Lord, will you make me to be more patient? Lord, help me not to get angry. Lord, help me to be more self-control. You could, it's, it's more, Jesus, you have all the patience I need. Live your life through me. Jesus, you have all the self-control I need. Would you live your life through me? Jesus, you didn't get angry when people just tried to tick you off. Would you live your life through me? That is what it means to let Jesus live his life through you. Now, here's the other thing. When you, when you became a Christian, you came to God and you said, I accept the gift of salvation by faith in Jesus. And now every day of your life, you say, I accept the gift of Jesus' life in me by faith. Now, Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but Christ lives in me, and the life I now live in this mortal body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So what we do is we wake up every morning, and we start by saying, thanks be to God, sin has no power over me. Jesus, you have set me free today. Live your life through me. You, you wake up every day and you, with that prayer, thank you, God. You tell me, and I'm, I believe it, I don't understand it. You tell me sin has no power over me, but I do know this, that Jesus has set me free, and he wants to live his life through me, so here I am. I present myself to you. Lord Jesus, live your life through me. What's wrong with you and me is that we are on this side of heaven. And as long as we're on this side of heaven, we're going to feel the ongoing struggle with sin in our mortal bodies. The law of sin and death in your body is in constant conflict with the law of the spirit of life operating in the new you. How do we get out of this mess? We can't. But Jesus can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. So we start every day and we and all throughout the day we keep turning back when we're tempted, when we blow it, we go back and we say, God, I thank you that sin has no power over me. Jesus, you've died to set me free today. Live your life through me. I'm trusting you to live your life through me. And the problem is the same every day. But the mercies of God are new every morning. Thanks be to God. Sin has no power over me. Jesus has set me free through his Holy Spirit living in me. Father God, thank you for Romans chapter 7. <clears throat> we would prefer it if you had just kind of made it a whole lot more simple. But there's, some, but for, there's a reason, I think, Lord, that you have given us meat here instead of milk, and that is you want us to think on these things. You want us to, th- to think our way into life change. And so as we wrestle with these truths in Romans 5 and 6 and 7, and as we move into Romans chapter 8, Our desire is we want to live the Christian life the way you intend for us to live it. We're tired of living by willpower. We're tired of coming up with more rules and regulations because we all know the harder we try, the harder we fall. So we invite you, Holy Spirit, to open our eyes to see these truths open our minds to understand them and open our wills to want them to be put into our lives so that we can reflect who Jesus is in a world that's living under the shadow of condemnation in the darkness of sin. Help them to see in us the light of your love. In Jesus' name, amen.